subscribe, stay up to date. Episodes drop every other Monday. Welcome to the Matt Watch That Podcast, the place for reviews, rants, and randomness. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to watch a movie or TV pilot that I probably should have seen but never got around to. It could be a recent favorite, critic's choice, or cult classic. To join in on the conversation, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page or I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what I should see next, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Before we start, March is Women's History Month, and to celebrate their contribution to our society and the arts, this episode will feature movies, television, and music of some very talented women. And we'll start with someone who I only recently discovered. Sister Rosetta Tharp, the godmother of rock and roll. She was born on March 20th, 1915, in Cotton Plant, Arkansas. Her parents were cotton pickers and religious singers as part of the Church of God in Christ. At the age of four, she took up the guitar and was known as a musical prodigy. She started performing as a special attraction at her mother's church services, singing popular hymns and gospel tunes. She was signed to Decca Records and became an overnight sensation, seamlessly blending religious themes with rock and roll riffs. Over her career, she had successful singles including Rock Me, Down by the Riverside, This Train, Up Above My Head, Beams of Heaven, You Gotta Move, which used the call and response technique that would become popular in soul music, and Strange Things Happen Every Day, which is considered the first rock and roll record. Her style has influenced guitarists Johnny Cash, Eric Clapton, Keith Richards, Jeff Beck, and musicians Aretha Franklin, Elvis Presley, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Isaac Hayes. In her personal life, she had been married a couple of times, but it would be her relationship with pianist Maria Knight that would be an open secret in the industry. She was posthumously inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as an early influencer in 2018, she was elected into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2014 and received a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in 2020. A stretch of highway in Cotton Plant, Arkansas was renamed for her in 2017. As a bonus feature on the Matt Watch That Playback playlist on YouTube, I'll be selecting a few of her tunes for your enjoyment. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is Skip It, two stars Watch At Your Own Risk, three stars Standard Fair, four stars Worth Checking Out, and five stars Must See. Now, if I give a title five stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. On this episode of the podcast, I'll be reviewing Norma Ray from 1979. It was directed by Martin Ritt, who helmed The Long Hot Summer, Ombre, The Great White Hope, and was nominated for Best Director at the 1964 Academy Awards for HUD. The screenplay was co-written by Ivan Ravitch and Harriet Frank Jr., who scribed Ombre, Murphy's Romance, Stanley and Iris, and was nominated for Best Writing, screenplay based on material from another medium for HUD and Norma Ray. It was inspired by the story of Crystal Lee Sutton, a union organizer and advocate. It stars Sally Field as Norma Ray Wichard slash Wilson slash Webster. She was cast in the sitcom Gidget, which was canceled after one season, but it would be her second series, The Flying Nun, where she found success as Sister Bertrell for three seasons, 82 episodes. After she made appearances in Marcus Welby, M.D., Night Gallery, and The Girl with Something Extra, it would be the role of Sybil in the TV miniseries that earned her a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama or Comedy Special. Her breakthrough on the big screen would be in the movie Smokey and the Bandit, which I reviewed in Season 1 of the podcast and has since become one of my remote drop movies. She would appear in three other movies with Burt Reynolds, Smokey 2, Hooper, and The End. In 1984, she appeared in Places in the Heart, winning an Academy Award for Best Actress in a Leading Role, which spawned the You Like Me, Right Now You Like Me, acceptance speech, which is often misquoted as You Like Me, 
you really like me, which is wrong, really wrong. She's since appeared in Steel Magnolias, Soap Dish, Mrs. Doubtfire, Forrest Gump, and Lincoln. She returned to television in the series Brothers and Sisters for five seasons, 109 episodes from 2006 to 2011. One of the most decorated actresses of her generation, she's been nominated for eight Primetime Emmy Awards, winning two, and three Academy Awards, also winning two. This is something to look out for. Director Martin Ritt has a cameo appearance as a disgruntled factory worker. So let's jump into it. Norma Ray Wilson works at the O.P. Henley Textile Mill, alongside her mother and father, Leona and Vernon Wichard, who she also lives with. The working conditions aren't ideal, there are long hours with infrequent breaks, her mother has experienced temporary hearing loss from working around the pulsating machines. Ruben Warshawski knocks on the door of the Wichard household. He just got into town from New York and was looking for a place to stay. When Vernon offers the local hotel with 12 rooms or the motel with 36 rooms, Reuben says he would prefer a place in the house as he wants to get to know the mill hands because he's a labor organizer looking to unionize the O.P. Henley textile mill. Vernon tells him that every time an organizer comes into town, the folks always get thrown out of their jobs, and the cotton mill is the only employment. Norma Ray meets up with her current fling, George, at the Golden Cherry Motel. She tells him this would be the last time they're hooking up. He has a wife and two kids in high school. She's got two young ones at home. She doesn't want the town to gossip. He's insulted that she would suggest dumping him and hits her. As she leaves the room with a bloody nose, Reuben invites her in and offers ice for her face. The next morning, Reuben hands out leaflets for the Textile Workers Union of America to the arriving factory workers. A supervisor, Jimmy Jerome Davis, confronts him and Reuben says, We've already got six of you boss men in civil contempt. Norma Ray is called into the boss's office. He says that she's got the biggest mouth at the mill, always complaining about longer work breaks and more smoking time, and the only way to appease her is with a promotion to spot checking, where she makes sure that each employee is meeting their quotas. It'll earn her another dollar fifty per hour. The employees, who used to be her friends and equals, starts to freeze her out, calling her a fink for snitching to the boss about their production. Her father even objects to her new position. Norma Ray charges into the boss's office, and when she's asked to be fired from the position, he demotes her back to the weaving room. She decides to go to the next meeting of the Textile Workers Union of America to support unionization. Here's a quote without context. Gentlemen, your average working man is not stupid. He just gets tired. Norma Ray is an important movie to watch, especially if you don't have any context to past working conditions in the United States and current conditions in unregulated countries. It also highlights the importance of unions, especially when companies are willing to put the bottom line over the needs of their employees. If companies would do the right thing, there would be no need for unions, but unfortunately, corporate greed and profits become paramount in business. But I feel that some unions give themselves a bad reputation because they support and defend workers who are subpar. A perfect example is the Major League Baseball Umpires Association. Angel Hernandez should not be a Major League umpire. But no matter his transgressions, no matter how awful he is at his job, the union will blindly support his behaviors. This is where unions fail. But what I found interesting about the movie was that the workers were really resistant to unions. There were legitimate reasons, but the working conditions were poor, and this was a way to take a bit of control back for the workers, so I would think they'd be more open-minded to it. Sally Field was good as always, but I was much more impressed with Rob Liebman, who I knew as Rachel Green's father on Friends. I think he's tremendous in this, and in some cases outshines the main character. Bo Bridges plays Sonny, a co-worker and eventual love interest. I understand why he's in the film, but that particular storyline seemed to come out of nowhere and progressed really fast. I'm not sure if it's needed, but he did a good job. Overall, the movie feels very 70s. It has that gritty look and feel that was commonplace in the industry. It also helped that they shot on location, which gave more authenticity to the time period and surroundings. It's a little slow going at points, but it's a character-focused piece and works on that level. Now for a little trivial trivia. It has three Academy Award anomalies. 
The Best Actress nomination was the only performance from a leading lady whose movie was also nominated for Best Picture. It's also the only Best Picture nominee whose director wasn't nominated. And lastly, it's the only Best Picture nominee that was also nominated for Best Original Song. Norma Rae was filmed on location in Alabama, lucky them. The cinematography was captured by John A. Alonzo, whose filmography includes Harold and Maude, The Bad News Bears, Scarface, Runaway, Steel Magnolias, Internal Affairs, and was nominated for Best Cinematography at the 1975 Academy Awards for Chinatown. It was edited by Sidney Levin, who worked on Mean Streets, Nashville, The Cheap Detective, Nuts, and He Said, She Said. The score was composed by David Shire, who wrote the music for The Promise, Short Circuit, Monkey Shines, Zodiac, and won Best Music Original Score for Norma Rae. The soundtrack featured songs by Dolly Parton and Johnny Cash. The single, It Goes Like It Goes, was written by David Shire and Norman Gimbel, and performed by Jennifer Warnes, best known for the duet Up Where We Belong with Joe Cocker. The runtime is 1 hour 50 minutes. It had a budget of $4.5 million and grossed $22 million at the box office. It was nominated for four Oscars at the 1980 Academy Awards for writing, screenplay based on material from another medium, music, original song, best actress in a leading role for Sally Field, and best picture. I give it 3.75 out of 5 stars. If you've seen Norma Ray and have opinions on the movie, let me know what you think using the hashtag MattWatchThat. Dumb. Moving right along. Each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there will be a playlist called Matt Watch That Playback. Roisin Conaty is a stand-up comedian from Camden, London, England. I was first introduced to her through guest appearances on British comedy panel shows, 8 out of 10 Cats Does Countdown, Would I Lie to You, Have I Got News for You, and Taskmaster. She started her comedy career at the age of 24 when she participated at an open mic night in London's Crouch End. It took her seven years to hone her stand-up routine and make the talk show circuit with performances on Russell Howard's Good News, The Jonathan Ross Show, Live at the Apollo, and the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, where she won Best Newcomer, one of only five female comedians to ever receive the honor. In 2013, she was cast as a series regular on Man Down, starring Greg Davies. The series would last four seasons, 26 episodes from 2013 to 2017, she wrote and starred in the sitcom Game Face, where she played Marcella Donahue, a struggling actor who seeks out the help of a life coach. It lasted two seasons, 12 episodes from 2017 to 2019. She earned the role of Roxy, a sex worker with a heart of gold, in Afterlife, created by Ricky Gervais. She appeared in 12 episodes over the first two seasons. I've selected a couple of clips that show her style of comedy. She tends to play up ditziness, but in actuality, she's really bright, quick as a whip, and ultimately very funny. The first clip features Roisin in 8 out of 10 Cats Does Countdown, a series where you show off your maths and word skills. Not exactly her strong suit. The next is from Would I Lie to You, where panelists have to determine if the story you're telling is true or false. Clip 3 is an interview from Afterlife, where Roisin talks about her character in the series. And the last is a couple of bloopers from the series Man Down. They're all available in the Matt Watch That Playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about Dead to Me. Created by Liz Feldman, who worked on All That, Blue Collar TV, The Ellen DeGeneres Show, and Two Broke Girls. It tells the story of Jen Harding, a real estate agent whose husband was killed in a hit and run, and while attending a support group, befriends Judy Hale, who initially claims her fiancé died of a heart attack. They soon form a bond, and Jen invites Judy to live in her guest house. The friends are played by Christina Applegate, who's been a working actress since she was a child. She appeared in episodes of Charles in Charge, Washington, Silver Spoons, Family Ties, and 21 Jump Street, but it would be her role as Kelly Bundy on Married with Children that skyrocketed her to fame. 
Her first lead in a movie would be one of my favorite cult classics, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. She's since been cast in Mars Attacks, Mafia, Employee of the Month, and Anchorman. She appeared on Broadway in Sweet Charity and earned a Tony nomination for Best Actress in a Musical. She also starred in two other series, Jesse and Samantha Who. In 2003, she won a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Guest Actress in a Comedy Series for Friends. She's since been nominated for an additional six awards. Linda Cardellini made her television debut in the live-action Saturday morning series Bone Chillers for one season, 13 episodes. She made appearances in Third Rock from the Sun, Clueless, Step by Step, and the first season of The Lot. But it would be her role as Lindsay Weir on the cult classic Freaks and Geeks that put her on the map. On the feature side, she was cast in Legally Blonde, Good Burger, Dead Man on Campus, Scooby-Doo, and Green Book. She's been nominated three times for a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Guest Actress in a Drama Series for Mad Men, Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series, and Outstanding Comedy Series for Dead to Me. The series has a lot of twists and turns. The comedy can be considered dark, but it's really the performances of the actors that keep you coming back, no matter how outlandish the story gets. As a side note, Christina Applegate was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis during the third season, and while it wasn't written into the show, there were more scenes where her character was less mobile. Like a trooper, she wanted to complete the series and finish the story of Jen and Judy. Dead to Me was on for three seasons, 30 episodes from 2019 to 2022. That's all for this edition of Matt Watch That. Thanks for listening to me babble. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what movie or TV pilot I should see, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Head over to MattSarosky.com for the latest news and updates. And come back next time for the reviews, rants, and randomness. It stars Sally Field as Norma Way. Norma Way. <laughs> Director Martin Ritt has a cameo appearance as a disgruntled. As a disgruntled. Director Martin Ritt has a cameo appearance as a disgruntled. <laughs> Twice. Says a disgruntled. Says a disgruntled. Says a disgruntled. <laughs> now it's a tick. It would be the role of Sybil in the medieval. In the medieval. Ugh.